Greetings, my name is Lucas Mann and I'm the pastor of the Spring Church here in Lawrence, South Carolina, just a few miles down the road. And I come out here this afternoon to bring to you the gospel of grace, the good news of Jesus Christ, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost. And that you yourselves as well have sinned against God, but that Christ is a great Savior, a sufficient Savior. Yes, our sin is great, but Christ's grace is much greater indeed. I'm here to warn sinners, to warn transgressors about the impending judgment, about the wrath of God that will soon be poured out upon the wicked. To warn those who are, who are lost, who are on the road to destruction, that Jesus Christ saves. I'm here to make much of sin, but it is only that I might make much of the Savior, that I might exalt the Lamb of God who was slain upon the cross of Calvary and there bore the wrath of God against the sins of the people of God. And that three days later, He rose from the grave. The Father vindicated His Son. Christ is alive today and forevermore. Hallelujah! Hallelujah unto God! Indeed and indeed. And ultimately... I come out here this afternoon to exalt God. This is an act of worship unto God, an act of praise to God. Because God has done great things in His Son by sending Him into the world to save ungodly wretches. It's glorious. It's the beauty of the Gospel. The Gospel is not about you or it is not about me. It's not about us. It's about the glory of God. It's about God receiving glory that is due to His holy name. The triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit is working all things for His glory. Is working all things to bring His name glory. To bring His name all the honor. And so when we consider salvation, we see that it is all by the grace of God. And therefore God gets all the glory. So ultimately this afternoon, that is my desire is to, as I preach the Gospel, to exalt God. Open-air preaching is at worship. It's worshiping God in the public realm. So may God be glorified as Christ Jesus is preached. Paul himself said something very interesting concerning his own preaching ministry. In 1 Corinthians 2.2, he said, concern, he said to, the, to the Corinthians, He said, For I determined to know nothing among you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Friends, that's what I am determined to preach among you, is Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The power of the cross is glorious. In fact, Paul said later on, or excuse me, earlier in this book, in the, in the book of 1 Corinthians, in chapter 1, he said, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And so it is that word of the cross that I seek to make known this afternoon. By the grace of God and for the glory of God. Now the text of Scripture that I would like to highlight before you this afternoon is found in the book of Romans. In Romans chapter 3, Romans chapter 3, the second half of verse 22, and then I'm going to read down all the way through verse 20, 23. Paul writes simply, he says, For there is no distinction, verse 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Very simple. Very simple is are these two verses here together. Simple truths, yet so profound and so beyond our comprehension. Oftentimes when we try to fully grasp them, we step back in awe. Having been confounded by the depth of these truths, by the vastness of them. And that is just the nature of the Word of God, my friends. Indeed, the Word of God is powerful. In fact, we now know from the book of Hebrews that the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. And it penetrates even dividing the soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. That's from Hebrews 4.12. And that ultimately is what I seek to make known to you this afternoon is the truth of Scripture. I have nothing else to say to you than what the Bible has to say. I have nothing else to preach than what the Bible has to say. And let us therefore not speculate beyond what Scripture says. 
And let us not be a go beyond the teaching of Christ. For as we know from the book of 2 John, that if any man does not abide in the teaching of Christ, he does not have God. We must abide in the truth of the Gospel. We must remain in that truth. We must believe it, accept it. We must embrace it. We must remain in that if we are to be saved. Such a, such a great act, such an impossible act, an act of faith is only accomplished by God giving us the faith to do so. To believe that Gospel is a gift of God all its own. There is no distinction. In other words, it does not matter what your ethnic or sociological background is, friends. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. We have fallen short of God's glory. That is, we have fallen short of, of pleasing and obeying and walking in obedience to God. But what does that truly mean? What does that really mean to fall short of the glory of God? What does it mean to have sinned? Well, these things are what I want to consider this afternoon. These truths are what I want to preach to you concerning this afternoon. What does it mean to have sin? What does it mean to fall short of the glory of God? And ultimately, we know this much that even just looking at the text on the surface, that we need to be reconciled. So ultimately, how can we be reconciled to God? And I hope to make known to you this afternoon that it is only through Jesus Christ. God bless you, sir. Christ Jesus is the only mediator between God and man. The only mediator. But before I do, I want to also consider the context of where Paul has come from and where he is going here in Romans 3. He is, in Romans chapter 1 and 2 and half of chapter 3, has thoroughly made known the reality of man's sin before God. He has, as we could, we could say, he's preached the bad news. That we've sinned against God and we deserve hell for our sin. But right here in, at the end of chapter 3, or I should say halfway through, Paul transitions and he begins to show us the glory of the gospel of grace. That the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, came into the world to save sinners. That He propitiated the wrath of God. He appeased the wrath of the Almighty against us in our sin so that we could be reconciled to Him. So later on he says this concerning Jesus in verse 25. He says, Whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness. So here we have Paul brings forth the Gospel, but of course before he does that he brings the bad news down to bear. We can only understand God's grace and mercy as it has been revealed in Christ insofar as we have come to grasp the holy wrath of God that we rightly deserve to be unleashed on us for all eternity. We must grasp the bad news before we can see the beauty of the good news. Because when we look at the Gospel, it's contrasted with the bad news, with the drape of the bad news that is draped behind it. So Paul does that. And here in verses 22 and 23, he summarizes really all that he said so far and reminds us of a truth he has just brought to the reader's attention. He's really wanting to stress this point that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So that brings us there to the end of verse 22. Let's look at these two verses here. Verse 22 says, For there is no distinction. Let's stop right there. There is no distinction. That is that it's not as if there are people who are worse sinners than others. There are sins that are worse than others, but in terms of the, the just penalty that we deserve for our sin, we're all on the equal plane of condemnation. We're all on the same equal plane before God. And we're all in equal need, dire need of a Savior of Christ the Lord. It is not as if there are some who are worse sinners than us. No, but we ourselves need to repent or we will likewise perish. That very phrase Jesus used in Luke 13. He said this in verse 4 of Luke 13. He is speaking here to unbelieving Jews. He says, Or do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them, 
Now just stop right there. The time, the, 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 there had been an event in Jesus' day. There, uh, Siloam was a, was, a, was a part of the city of Jerusalem. And a tower had fallen and apparently killed 18 people. And Jesus says, Were those people worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? He says in verse 5, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Jesus dispels the myth that there are some who are worse sinners than others in the sense of being condemned before God. There is not, my friends. Whether you are black or white, or rich or poor, whether you are famous or not well known, whether you are politically astute or not, you have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. There is no distinction. No distinction between male and female, young or old. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Therefore, all need Christ. All need to be saved from their sins. Whether you are young or old, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. So I exhort you, in the words of Acts 16.31, to believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. To repent and to return so that your sins may be washed away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. That is why the call of the gospel goes out to all the world, because all the world has fallen short. And this is something that the sinner can take hope in. This is something that you and I can have solace and rest in. Because yes, we have fallen short of the glory of God, but the call of the gospel of Jesus Christ has gone, gone forth into all the world. And therefore it is for anyone to grab hold of. It is for anyone to claim, to cling to for eternal life. Jesus said, for the one who comes to me, I will by no means cast out. He said in, in Matthew 11, He said, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. There is no distinction indeed. Verse 23 of Romans 3, Paul says, For all have sinned. What is sin, we ask ourselves? What does it mean to sin? What does it mean to, to commit a transgression against the Most High? Well, sin is transgression of the law. That is what sin is. It is breaking God's holy law, His Ten Commandments, which He has given for us to obey. And perhaps if you have a religious background or have grown up in church, then you perhaps are, are aware of these commands. And therefore, you ought to be aware that of your inability to keep them. Your absolute inability to keep them. That we ourselves have sinned by breaking God's law Sin is not just this abstract idea that has no bearing in reality. Sin is breaking God's law. It is when God says you shall not lie, we lie. Or when God says you shall not steal, we, we have stolen. Or when God says you shall not blaspheme, that we take His name and use it in an irreverent manner. Or when God says you shall not commit adultery and people become unfaithful. People are unfaithful to their spouses. Or men look with lust, women look with lust. That's breaking God's law. That is sin. The law of, go the law of God is, is glorious and perfect. It shows us the character of God. In fact, Psalm 19 verse 7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making the wise simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous 
all together. So it shows us God's holy character. It shows us the purity, the beauty, the wonder, the goodness of God. But it shows us that we have fallen short of that. And so when we sin, we are offending the character of God. We are acting in contradiction to the character of God. And that leads me to the next point. The next section of this verse in verse 23 of Romans 3. When it says, For all have sinned, and then it says, and fall short of the glory of God. These two are inexorably linked to one another. They are joined at the hip. To sin is to fall short of the glory of God. And to fall short of the glory of God is to sin. Because when we sin, what happens? We act in contradiction to the law of God, which ultimately reflects the character of God. And the character of God is really the essence of His glory, who He is, as He has revealed Himself unto us. And so when we sin... We offend His character. We act in contradiction to His character. That is sin. For there is no distinction. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now we ask ourselves, the cause of sin, in other words, where has sin come from? For we read in the book of Genesis that when God made everything, it was all very good. He declared it to be so. The creation originally was perfect. But now we live in a, in a world that is oftentimes chaotic. A world that it has faults in it. We live amongst society that has faults in it. We, you know, even our own hearts are perverse, desperately wicked. What has happened? Creation has been fractured by sin. When we ourselves go back all the way to the book of Genesis, there in those early chapters, we find the story of how man fell. Adam was the first man God created and put him in the garden there. Gave him a wife, gave him Eve. And the command was that Adam could eat of any of the food of the garden, any of the fruit that was available. But he could not eat the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. But he sinned against God. He rebelled against the Most High. He did not keep the covenant of works. He did not keep the, the, the charge that the Most High gave him. And so therein do we find the cause of sin. The serpent there deceived Adam and Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. To eat that which God had forbade them. And therefore, sin entered the world. Man was now alienated from God. And that ultimately is why Jesus Christ had to come into the world to reverse the work of Satan, to destroy the work of the enemy. In fact, right after man fell, God promised the Redeemer's coming. Right after man fell in the garden, it's quite incredible that God preached the Gospel Himself with His own voice there in the garden audibly for the, both the man, the woman, and even the serpent himself to hear. For we find in Genesis 3, verse 15, God speaks to the serpent who had just deceived man and woman. He says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, between, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. And we know ultimately Christ came to do that very thing. He came to crush the skull of Satan, to destroy the works of the enemy. And He has certainly accomplished that by His grace and for His own glory. So to glory to the Lord Jesus Christ indeed. That's the cause of sin. That is the cause of sin in this world. And as I just covered, the essence of sin, the nature of sin is breaking God's law. But what is the result of sin? What is the result of iniquity? And I'm speaking just in terms of eternity. Well, the result of sin is eternal damnation. Is being lost in the lake of fire is being damned in hell, being cast into that place of weeping and gnashing of teeth where God's wrath is administered upon the wicked. And it is not a place where you want to go, friends. It is not a place that you want to go and be, to be tormented day and night. One day God's wrath will finally be administered and souls will be lost in the lake of fire. As it says in Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, 
but for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Friends, I don't want you to go there. Heaven's gates are open wide for all those who run to Jesus Christ, who find access to God in the Lamb of God, who find access to the Father through the Son. As the old hymn says, O oh, come to the Father through Jesus Christ the Son and give Him the glory, the great things He has done. Sin kills, but Jesus saves. Sin destroys, but Christ saves. Sin damns, but Christ saves. Sin will bring upon you eternal ruin. And not only that, but that's not even to consider the ruin it brings upon souls in this life. I myself, though, I have been restrained in many ways from committing evil acts of wickedness, though that was there in my heart to do so. I certainly had brought upon my own self by my sin great pains in this life. Sin, my friends, ruins both this life and the life to come. But as the Lord Jesus Himself said in John chapter 8, if the Son makes you free, you will be free indeed. You're a slave to sin, my friends. But if you are in Christ, you have now become a slave to righteousness. And you need to become a slave to righteousness. Slave to holiness. A slave to purity. For when you are a slave of Jesus Christ, only then, then and only then, are you truly free. That is why Jesus could say, if the Son makes you free, He will be free indeed. So come. Come ye who are weary, all ye who are lost, and embrace Christ Jesus. Believe upon the Lord Jesus Christ. Repent and believe the Gospel, my friends. Receive the righteousness of Christ to your account as a gift of grace. For it is not by the works of the law that we are justified, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Faith in the finished work of Christ. God forgives the sins of His people on account of the atoning work of His Son. Hallelujah. Hallelujah unto God indeed. But who is this God? Who is this God of glory that has manifested Himself, has revealed Himself both in creation and in special revelation? That is, the Holy Scriptures. Who is the God of glory? Well, He is the triune God. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. One being an essence in nature, yet three eternal persons, co-equal. That is the God of glory. And He is so holy. So righteous is He. In fact, the prophet Isaiah was granted a great privilege to have a vision of the Lord of hosts. I'll just read off the text to you because he will give context. Isaiah chapter 1, or excuse me, chapter 6 verse 1 says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted with the train of His robe filling the temple. Seraphim stood above Him, each having six wings. With two He covered His face, and with two He covered His feet, and with two He flew. Now seraphim were angels. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory, and the foundations of the thresholds trembled at the voice of Him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. Then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, for I, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Quite incredible indeed that Isaiah here pins these words that the angels were crying out to one another. God is three times, thrice-fold holy. That is, that He is sanctified, set apart from all that is perverse and wicked and ungodly, and in all His ways and dealings, He is good, righteous, and just. 
Absolutely. He absolutely is. The psalmist said in Psalm 119, 137, Righteous are you, O Lord, and upright are your judgments. So holy is He. So holy is the Lord. The whole earth is full of His glory. Even Isaiah there in Isaiah 6, when he saw the glory of God, he was, he was woefully terrified. He was fearful because God is to be feared. We must fear the Lord, my friends. God is to be feared. He is to be feared indeed. God is also gracious and compassionate. He abounds in loving kindness. Nahum 1.3 says, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. Indeed, God is slow to anger, very patient with the wicked. In fact, 1 John 4.8 tells us God is love. He manifests great love even towards sinners in a generic sense, but especially toward His people in the salvific sense, in saving them, in sending His Son to save them. Christ Jesus is glorious. He is the perfect manifestation of the love of God, the mercy, the kindness, the grace of the Holy One. But these attributes of God, His grace, His compassion, never negate His holiness or His righteousness. They are, they are in beautiful harmony with one another. We are not to think that we can pick and choose the attributes of God that we like and the ones we do not like. Let us not be so proud as to say that or do that. And as mentioned earlier, what has God done specifically in relation to His law, well, He has put forth His law and that shows us His character. It, it spells it out, as it were, quite literally, for us. It shows us how is He holy. It defines it, we could say. It takes perhaps something that would otherwise be abstract and hard to grasp and it brings it down to reality, to this world, and helps us to see and discern how holy God is. Exodus 20 is a is the first time God's Ten Commands are given. It's God's holy law, His moral law revealed unto us. It says in Exodus chapter 20, verse 12 says, Honor your father and mother, that your days may be prolonged in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Verse 13, You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. These commands, though they are not all of them, this is not, I did not read the entirety of the text. My friends, these commands show us the character of God. The holy, perfect character of God. They show us how is He righteous? How is He just? It is in these ways that He is so. For we consider the commands, one of them, for example, you shall not murder. God is not a murderous God. Therefore, He condemns murdering. God is not an unfaithful God. He is a faithful covenant-keeping God. Therefore, He requires of couples, of, of husbands and wives, to be faithful to one another. You shall not steal. Why does God give that command? Because, of course, God owns all things. He has the divine prerogative to tell us what we ought to do with that which He owns. And then, of course, the forbidding of lying. We know from the book of Hebrews, God cannot lie. It is an impossibility for God to lie. And so therein do we see His holy character. You could, you could conceive of God's law in this manner, that it is a mirror. It is a mirror which reflects to us a glorious picture, a glorious image, the character of God, who God is. But also it reflects to us our sin, our fallenness, and I, I spoke on this earlier. 
when commenting on the text which reads, we have all fallen short, we all fall short of the glory of God. For you yourselves know, and I know, that I and you cannot keep these commands. You shall not murder. You say, I've never murdered anybody. Well, Jesus came along in Matthew 5 and said, if you have anger in your heart, then you've murdered. If you have anger in your heart towards someone, you've murdered them. God regards it as the same. He regards hatred in the heart as murder. God is so holy, friends. He sees your thoughts. He sees your desires. He sees the inward man. And He sees that it is wicked. You shall not commit adultery. You say, again, I've been faithful to my spouse or perhaps my boyfriend or girlfriend. However, friends, Jesus again in that same chapter in Matthew 5 says if you look at a woman with lust or you look at a man with lust, God sees you as having committed adultery in your heart. Again, He sees the mind, He sees the heart. And He sees the wickedness of the mind and heart. He sees your perversion. He sees your wickedness, friends. You shall not steal. Have you ever stolen? Then you're condemned to hell for your sins. Please embrace Christ. Don't go to hell for your sins. Don't lose your soul for your sins. Instead, come to the Lamb of God. Come ye who are weary, all of you who are lost. Embrace Christ Jesus. Oh my friends, I can tell you from the authority of the Word of God that Christ is glorious. And I can tell you even from my own experience having been saved by His wondrous grace, that He is glorious. Lastly, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. That is, God forbids lying. Have you ever lied? Then you are condemned. All liars will perish in hell. So we are condemned to hell, having broken God's law without hope in and of ourselves. However, praise be unto the Most High that God did not leave us in this state of helplessness. But in eternity past, He set aside a people unto Himself. He predestined His church. He chose them from the foundation of the world. And He covenanted with the Son. He agreed with the second person of the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ, that He would come and die for us and then receive the reward of having died for us. And even the Spirit agreed to come and equip Jesus to do what He did in His life and then to apply the benefit of His work to our hearts. My friends, so when the fullness of the times came, Jesus came into the world. Christ Jesus was born of a virgin. He was born under the law. And He fulfilled God's law for us. He fulfilled God's law on behalf of sinful people. He Himself said in Matthew 5.17, Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Which is quite incredible to think about that He came to fulfill those 400 plus Old Testament prophecies. And then, not only that, but He fulfilled the law. God's law that we cannot keep, that you and I cannot live in obedience to. He kept the commands. He never lied. He never stole. He never blasphemed. He never dishonored His parents. Quite incredible was the life of Christ. And He had the power to do so because He Himself is the Almighty. He is God. Truly man, truly God. And so friends, He did that. He was the innocent one, the perfect one. The holy Lamb of God. Holy, harmless, and undefiled. The Righteous One. And friends, Christ Jesus graciously died for sinners upon that cross. He was stretched upon the cross of Calvary, nailed there, publicly humiliated. Even His own disciples, out of fear, abandoned Him that night. And He was betrayed by one of them, a false disciple, Judas, into the hands of sinful men and nailed there to the cross of Calvary. Jesus said in John 3 at the beginning of His ministry, He said, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. Friends, Christ has been lifted up upon the cross, 
publicly for all the world to see. And upon that cross, He bore the sins of the people of God. He bore the guilt of His people. He took ownership of our rebellion and our sin, as it were. And the Father required of Him the penalty. He required of Him the punishment. We deserve hell for our sins, friends. And upon that cross, Christ drank the hell that His people deserve to be unleashed on them eternally. He bore the wrath of the Father. So glorious is the love of God. So wonderful is the grace and mercy of God that God Himself would condescend to die for the creation. The Creator dying on behalf of His creation. Isaiah 53 says, Surely our griefs He Himself bore and our sorrows He carried, yet we ourselves have seemed Him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But He was pierced through for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The chastening for our well-being fell upon Him and by His scourging we are healed. Verse 10 says, concerning the death of Christ, but the Lord was pleased to crush Him. He bore our sin and the wrath of God against our sin. Against us, friends. Against the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. He died for His bride. For that precious group of people whom He so dearly loved. He died there upon that cross and He satisfied the wrath of God. Not an ounce, not a drop left. Gone, put away. That is what the word propitiated means. It means wrath has been absorbed. It means to appease. And the wrath of the Father was absorbed and it was appeased. So therefore the text can say, but the Lord was pleased to crush Him. Hallelujah that God has manifested such glory, power in the cross of Jesus Christ. Three days later He was raised. The Father rose Him up from the grave as the public display that He had received His work. He had received the atoning sacrifice as the sufficient, perfect, complete, wonderful, and well-pleasing sacrifice for our sin that the Father had for totally received His sacrifice. Christ Jesus was vindicated, vindicated in the resurrection. Because He did not die as a guilty man in the sense that He had sinned, certainly not. He died regarded as being guilty. He wasn't actually guilty, but treated as if He was. So that sinners could be treated as if they were righteous. What a glorious exchange. What a glorious exchange indeed. The apostles themselves, the apostle Peter, in Acts 2, preaching to unbelieving Israelites, said this, verse 32, he said, This Jesus God raised up again, to which we are all witnesses. Christ appeared to many witnesses. This is historically verified. In fact, at one point we know from 1 Corinthians 15, He appeared to a group of 500 believers at one time. Quite incredible indeed. Forty days later, Christ was then exalted in glory. That is, that He sat down at the right hand of the Father in glory, in heaven, having accomplished redemption, having by His power and His might but purchased salvation for His people. Hebrews 12.2 says this, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Hallelujah, indeed. He has been exalted at the right hand of majesty on high. And friends, the call of the Gospel, the reaction that man ought to have unto this truth, is simply one of repentance and faith. Jesus said in Mark 1.15, very simply, that we must... He said, the time is fulfilled and the Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the Gospel. Those two things. Repentance is simply a brokenness over sin. It's a disgust. We are disgusted by our sin. Disgusted by our drunkenness. You ought to be disgusted by your pornography, your pride and your selfishness. You ought to be disgusted by your religious pride. 
And we're to humble ourselves, turn from that sin. Repentance in its essence is, is a change of mind, but it evidences in turning from sin. So we ought to say it is turning from sin. And then belief, belief in the Gospel is confidence in the Word of God. It's confidence in what God has said to be true concerning His Son. But not just this objective, oh yes, I believe Jesus died on the cross, but believe that Christ Jesus upon the cross died for me, that He interceded for me, that He bought salvation for me. It's personal. Salvation is a radical personal work of God. And so saving faith is personal. So we are to repent and believe the Gospel. And these precious things, repentance and faith, are not even something we can conjure up. They are both graces by, given to us by God. They are simply all of grace. We cannot bring them about in us. They are things which God does in us. But the result of having repentance and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ is that your sins will be forgiven. Past, present, and future because of the atoning work of Christ upon the cross if you are His. And if you repent and believe the Gospel, the Father forgives you of all sin, yes, but then imputes to your account the righteousness of Christ. Now the word impute simply means to credit to. So do not let that confuse you, friends. The word impute simply means to credit to. In other words, the Father credits us with having lived Jesus' life. Because Jesus was, having, was, having, was at the cross credited with having lived our lives if we are His. That's the glory of the Gospel. That Jesus takes my sin, I receive His righteousness. Jesus takes ownership of my guilt, and I take ownership. I am seen and regarded by the Father as having lived His life. So Christ not only died for sinners, but lived for them. That's the great exchange of the Gospel, friends. And that's what your hope must be hinged upon. Not your religious work. Not your performance. Not a church. Not even necessarily do your doctrines. But in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is all by grace, my friends. All by the free grace, mercy, and kindness of God. That's why Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. All of grace, friends. And for the one who has been genuinely saved, the one who has been saved, not only does God justify them, but He regenerates them. Now, the word regenerate means to recreate. In other words, He gives them a new nature, a new heart with new desires. That is one of the promises of the new covenant. That God will give to sinners a new heart with new desires. In fact, this is prophesied. This new covenant is, is spoken about in the Old Testament. In Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 20, uh, 36, excuse me, in verse 26, it says, God is here speaking through the prophet Ezekiel, and this is the promise of the new covenant. One of the glorious promises. It is this, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a, spirit with, a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to obey my ordinances. Verse 28, You will live in the land that I gave to your forefathers, so you will be my people and I will be your God. I, and Moreover, I will save you from all your uncleanliness. And I will... My friends, this is glorious, that God saves. God gives a new, a new nature to sinners. The one who has been saved has also been, as Jesus said, born again. When someone is converted and they now hate the things that God hates and they now love the things that God loves, they love holiness. They love the Word of God. They love to delight in the truth of God. They love the fellowship of the saints. They love the, the, the things of God that pertain to God. And they hate the things that God hates. They hate sin and iniquity. They turn from it. They turn from rebellion. They turn from pride. They turn from self-righteousness. And they look to the Lamb of God. 
They look to the Lord Jesus Christ as a source of all joy and all that they ever need. So my friends, I ask you to examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. If you say that you know Jesus Christ, then my question is, do you live for Christ? Do you love the Word of God and prayer and the fellowship of the saints? If not, then you're not in Christ. doesn't matter what kind of religious experience you've had or if a pastor has told you you're saved. I was falsely converted for eight years before God truly saved me. Jesus said in Matthew 7 that there are many on the road to destruction who think that they are on the road to life, who think they know Christ. But they will find out on the day of judgment that they were not truly converted, that they knew not the love of Christ. There are many who name the name of Jesus Christ, but do not know Him. Many who say that they have His saving grace, but it is not manifested in their lives. See, we work if we're converted. The, re the result of conversion is that you will work, that you will bear fruit of conversion. It is not so that you may be converted, it is because you have been converted. That's the, that's the proper understanding of works in relation to salvation. That they are the evidence of conversion, not the cause. Never is work the cause of salvation. It is only the evidence of it. It is the evidence that God has done a work in someone's heart when they now walk away from the things which they used to indulge in and they now walk toward the living God and they delight in Him. That's a work. That's a miracle of grace. God does still do miracles today, friends, and it is in the hearts of sin, sinful people. He gives them new hearts with new desires. They will, you will, hate the things that God hates and love the things that God loves if you are in Christ. If not, you need to repent and believe the Gospel. And if so, hallelujah, glory to God. And that leads me to the next thing. The Gospel is not just for the lost, it is for the child of God to rest in and to feed upon daily and to delight in and to preach to the lost. So for my brethren who are out here, please share the Gospel. Tell sinners about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and what that means. Tell them about their sin. Warn them about the wrath of God that is coming upon the wicked and call them to embrace Christ Jesus, to bow the knee in submission to Jesus Christ. It is all by the free grace of God. Ultimately, it is all that God might get all the glory. That God might receive all the glory. All things ultimately are working to that glorious end to bring God glory. All things are redounding to God's glory. As Romans 16, Paul writes, he says in verse 25, he says, Now to Him who is able to establish you according to My Gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested, and by the Scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations leading to obedience of faith, to the only wise God, through Jesus Christ be the glory forever. Amen. Friends, Paul here at the end of Romans gives glory to God, and even in Romans 11 he does the same thing. We are to ascribe glory to God. We are to give glory to the Most High because all things are redounding to His glory. So to God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Indeed and amen. If you are lost, come to Jesus Christ and live. If you, know, if you say you know Christ, examine yourself. And if you do, truly, hallelujah. And if you don't, repent and believe and be saved. And for my brethren, rest in the Gospel and share it with the lost by the grace of God and for the glory of God. So we have seen here in Romans 3, verses 22b and 23, that we have all sinned and fall short of the glory of God, but that Jesus Christ has come into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost, that He died and rose again on behalf of vile wretches, and all who embrace Him will be saved by the grace of God and for the glory of God. So to God be the glory forever and ever. Through Jesus Christ, amen and amen.